Thanks for coming. And let me show you the title of uh, this discussion, something that uh, I suspect you've been anticipating since uh, I started talking uh, the first day about the theme of this uh, year's winter session. All right, I, I've been interested in things related to truth, truth, trust, and propaganda for a while, and being a technologist, being a computer scientist, I've uh, been trying to answer the question of how things um, are going to be helped by technology, if at all. So um, you know my name, Takis Metaxas, and that's my Twitter handle, and I will be helped today with uh, several other people from uh, computer science and NCI lab, including uh, Lauren, who will um, help us go to break rooms down the road later on. So um, you're probably very much familiar with the concept of uh, being misinformed through social media. This is one of the tweets that was sent a couple of days, uh, uh, the day before the election, November 9, or it is the day of the election? It was the day of the election, right? I do remember in 2016. And this guy says, anti-Trump protesters in Austin today are not as organic as they seem. Here are the buses that they came in. Fake protesters, Trump 2016 in Austin. Do you happen to see this story? Yeah, it, it, is, uh, it got quite a bit of attention. It got 16,000 retweets and 14,000 um, likes. So it got quite a bit of attention at the time that the emotions were very, very high just before the elections. Mm -hmm. And what turns out was the case is that this was a new guy to Twitter who saw some buses. Uh, it so happened that the buses were in Austin for a conference, but he associated them with the uh, uh, anti-Trump uh, campaigns and he immediately tweeted that. He only had like 40 Twitter followers. And you see how many retweets he got? 16,000, okay? Um, once he realized that actually, no, the buses were not for that, he sent back a correcting tweet saying, no, 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 that was not it. But people kept retweeting the original one, ignored the other one. <coughs> so this is kind of the one type of misinformation that we do not always recognize it is happening. This is misinformation by accident. He made a mistake. Yet there were many people who were willing not only to believe him, but also to promote what they thought he was, uh, he was doing, he was saying. So this is the uh, kind of um, misinformation that happens accidentally. There is other kind of misinformation that happens with uh, direct intention. I'm sure you've heard the term fake news uh, and what it is. So um, one way to define fake news, people struggle to say exactly what it is. Um, in my book, it is lies, but they're formatted and circulated in such a way that the reader might mistake them for legitimate news. So there's kind of uh, front, uh, you see it is, you know what is the uh, story that's supposed to be related to that? It's the pizza gate thing, right? And um, so it, um, yeah, supposedly, Hillary Clinton and a bunch of other people were involved into a uh, um, child abuse ring that was operating out of the basement of a pizza in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It was irrelevant that this pizza had no basement. It was irrelevant there was no such ring, but it got quite a bit of attention. Uh, and some people did believe it. One of them actually went into the troubles of trying to rescue the kids, got a gun, went into the Pizza parlor started shooting around. Eventually, he lost his freedom because uh, thankfully he did not kill anybody, but he was arrested. Um, so it was quite a bit reported that, okay, Pizzagate was not a thing. Uh, that got a lot of attention just before the elections again. Um, and you would say, well, okay, that's clearly some kind of propaganda. is is not like uh, the other one. But um, months later, I was looking at Google to see if there is any evidence for Pizzagate. 
And all of the results I got, as you can see, were results that they were telling me that, yeah, Pizzagate is a thing. It is really a conspiracy of uh, the elite, in particular the democratic elite in, Was elite in Washington, D.C., uh, abusing children and try to hide it. And that's, you know, Google. If you look today, you will probably get different results. But let's say you find yourself in Google's shoes at that time. What would you do? Well, I guess it's kind of in the vein of what Facebook started to do and then kind of backed off on, which is to have certain filters that mark things as potentially fake, so that when people search, they can they can test, to, they can see if something is a verifiable source. Uh huh. So you might be tempted to find a way of checking whether some piece of information is correct or not. Okay. Oh. Um, just to like push back on that a little bit, I, I do think that there are sources of news though that aren't on mainstream sites that are accurate information though, and so I think that would be really hard to do in practice. Can you all hear the Especially responses? Especially like like blogs, for example, like as a mm -hmm. source for news and for information and people's like personal storytelling. That's not you know the Washington Post or New York Times or the you know, MSNBC, but like that is verifiable. That could be true. But also could be false, so it's hard to do that. So I feel that the front page of the results should be verifiable sources, and then like the rest of the non-verifiable ones should be given on the rest of the pages. Because if you just remove the non-verifiable posts, then you're also limiting information on Google, which is a bad thing. I think there's an issue with that too, uh, just because. A lot of times people don't, I barely ever go to the second page of my Google results anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think one possibility could be if something is a trending search and it's in current news, um, they could verify it themselves independently and do the box on the top like they do for other search results. They could also, uh, just if it's a trending search term, they could use Google and Facebook and, and Twitter to see if it's trending in other places. They could just say at the top. This is a trending issue. Be careful about what you what you read about it. Um, All right. Yeah. So we, we see quite a bit of complication. It doesn't seem like we have an easy answer, right, uh, for that. In one case, you might want to have verification. In the other case, what if it is you know somebody else's opinion? What what do you do about that? Well, it's good if they are ranking high in the front page, so at least we're not fooled right away. But uh, you know. If, if they're not in the front page, you're not going to be see them, seeing them, right? All right, so I want you to get into this uh, kind of thinking because one of the first things that people do when they see Google operating like that, it is like, oh, fix it, as if Google can, right? So um, I got interested in this topic, in the topic of how we find information uh, probably before most people, or at least I started writing about that, so that I knew. Um, in 2002, I wrote this article with one of uh, my uh, very smart students. Um, uh, Leah went uh, later on to law school at Stanford and now is a US attorney at the Department of Justice, actually, in, um, in Washington. And the title had this kind of catchy style. It says, of course it's true. I saw it on the internet. The reason I used this title was because uh, uh, when I was young, my father, whenever he wanted to show to me that something is true, would say, of course it's true, I saw it on the newspaper. <laughs> because for him, the newspapers were, you know, that's the printed word. You remember what we were talking about, the word being printed has power? Mm -hmm. You know, this is the same thing. We're not talking about the scriptures, but we're talking of the fact that we are grown in a, an environment, in a culture, in which when you see something written, has more validity. You expect that there is an editor, some kind of authority, that will get all of these things. Um, actually, I got interested in, in general, uh, what I was finding, let me finish with that, what I was finding in the survey we did at that time was that people were confusing the ease at which they were finding information with the validity of information. Mm -hmm. So if they could actually do a search, and Google in 2002 was very, very new, but it was the new kid in the block, everything seemed to be amazing about it. Uh, so if you were able to find something fast, 
quickly, then it must be so. And what was even more upsetting, and, and that might not uh, feel good in, for some of my students uh, in the technical side, those students who had greater technical um, ability, like our CS majors, were more likely to misjudge what was correct because they felt we are more in control of this system. We understand how this thing works. And who I found, there were no huge difference, but who I found to be a kind of better at this, the Davis scholars. Mm -hmm. Older students who, you know, have been around for a while. Um, okay, well, there is a trust that's been associated with the search engine itself. You see, from the early days, Google had this empty page with just one line that you could type something in and you actually had two choices. One is, you know, do a Google search, do a, uh, yeah. And the other is, I'm feeling lucky. Do you know what I'm feeling lucky does? Right, finds the very first results and takes you directly there. Does not even bother you to give any kind of, uh, even the results, not even the top 10, just the very first one. So Google, as every other search engine that has copied doing this kind of behavior, is trying to give us the assurance that, you know, we know our business, we know what we're doing, and you can even, you know, trust us to give you the answer. But Google can give you a lot of misinformation. And this is a search that I have recorded since 2005, January 29, 2005. I was doing a search for some of these um, uh, steroids, supposedly human growth hormone, has amazing effects if you do not know. You know, you uh, take one of these pills and you become uh, thinner, uh, taller, sexier, uh, richer, uh, everything that you want, you will be. $39.95 a month and that's it. So looking for the results, I saw no kind of worry. There is no result coming from any kind of health agency. And I started worrying about these kind of things and the fact that it seemed to be completely, uh, you know, without any kind of uh, uh, doubt. The advertisement also was all related to that. Some of them had a sense uh, of um, a conspiracy theory approach. What they don't want you to know, what it does to your body, uh, etc. Um, so all of these were like that. All right. Here is your challenge again. Let's say that you are in 2005 and you, like me, see that. What would you do? How would you address that? This is, is our health concerns. It's not, yeah. Health keywords. Maybe someone searches a search engine that has health words. Having a section that has the official like government agencies and official journals. Uh -huh. So for health? And if there's nothing there, like in this case, then be like no search results found in like link so they know that. Mm -hmm. OK. So if it is for health, maybe have some official results or you know, don't give them something. Yeah. I think one of the problems with that is like, how do you decide what is official, what isn't? Um, mm -hmm. How can you decide whether governmental studies are um, conducted in a responsible way or whether mm -hmm. they have bias associated with them? I think also um, there's a competing interest of Google in making money. I spent some time in my um, internship I did last summer doing search engine optimization. <laughs> and people can pay, like companies can pay Google um, to have their uh, companies show up higher in search results um, depending on different keywords and stuff. And so, like, Google's also trying to, like, has competing financial interests in uh, showing which ones will be displayed higher in the list. And so that's also Do you all hear mm -hmm. the responses? Thank you. Because I know it is, um, yeah. So, I, I, I'm very glad that you brought this uh, uh, thing up because. It's not that Google did not want to actually do something about that. Actually did, but paid half a billion dollars for not doing it right. In 2011, the results I was showing you, and I wrote about that as I will, you will see in a moment, was in 2005. In 2011, it was punished for promoting this kind of Canadian pharmacy um, 
unreliable information, medical information, because essentially these companies um, were paying Google to get space so that, um, so that tells us something, I guess, uh, that it might be too complicated of, a, of an answer to give to you know, have the most reliable information available online. But most of the time, it doesn't seem like we really realize it. Maybe, however, we have solved the problem since 2011. After Google paid this half a billion dollars, they really realized and they fixed it, right? Well, that's yesterday. Um, if you go and you do searches about global warming, you find the advertisement that they say, no such thing, you know, this is a conspiracy, this is bullshit. Now, this is not health related, so maybe the bar is not as high to worry about it, but should we allow this kind of blatant misinformation being displayed? Should Google do something about it? Are you getting tired thinking on behalf of Google? Or any other search engine? Yeah. Is it not possible to have like a third party agency who does fact checking? A third party doing fact checking. Yeah. That's an idea. What and do you think? Searching it, it you add a tagline onto whatever article so that when you open the page, the page is free to you, but you will have to physically close a red or whatever warning at the top saying that this has been third party verified, non-verified, or false. All right, so one approach is verify and make sure that people see it because they have to do something in order to close it. So, so the issue with that is like people come at different issues with different assumptions and, and like the assumptions that you have influence the, like the pathway you're gonna think about it. Mm -hmm. And so like one of the things like I have family that lives in like the Appalachian Mountains and Western Pennsylvania, and they don't believe the Washington Post because they inherently assume that like intellectualized mm -hmm. arguments are like trying to like pull a fast one on them, and they, they think that they're dumb, and so that they are very susceptible to like the like the websites that just any random person can create because they saw it on the internet, and it's not some like liberal elite trying to fix it for them, and like it it really depends on, like so like we might believe some third party source, mm -hmm. but also like who so would the third question party source be? is. Who is that third party? Yeah. To kind of go off of that, I think having Google or other tech companies or a third party organization decide what is good news, what is true, is a band-aid solution on a long-term problem that's about critical thinking in the American consciousness. And I think some of the classes that have influenced me the most growing up was in high school I had a class on what to trust when you're doing research and what kind of websites you should look at. And we were given like a series of websites and one was like researching Martin Luther King Jr. and one was actually like a hate website and they were like why shouldn't you try this what are some flags of what is untrue and then even in elementary school looking for websites that have org on the end or other kind of markers of reliability that i think mm. would be a much more long term and better way to combat this problem than just being like private corporations to your responsibility mm. all right so i need to get going uh, please oh, i think that there's also a sense in which a third party organization could lead to unintended consequences mm. for instance when evaluating whether a source is true there could be a climate change article that says that climate change is in fact occurring, but could have a graph with skewed or false data. Mm -hmm. And so the, the source of the, that article was false. Yeah. It could be intended as well. Climate change is in fact yeah. false if mm -hmm. only the data was wrong and the mm -hmm. conclusion was true. Complicated, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, if we get into the habit of having this kind of authoritative sites like the fact checkers, could I create my own fact checking? Who should? would stop me. I mean, <laughs> I know truth, right? Um, why Google is giving us misinformation? I think this cartoon kind of captures it quite nicely. This uh, old man says, I've spent my entire life <laughs> looking for meaning. Everybody's looking for meaning in their lives. And the kid says, well, if it's not on Google, you're not going to find it. <laughs> you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that mm -hmm. if you do not rank high in the search results, you may as well not exist. And this top 10 that we want to achieve is important because people, we know since the early 90s, people rarely go to page two of any kind of search results. I, I keep talking about Google, but keep in mind that every search engine behaves the same way. Essentially, mm -hmm. all these technologies that have been developed, everyone is using the same technology. So uh, this is the so-called problem of, uh, we used to call it web spam. 
but now a more kind of descriptive term is search engine manipulation effect. It is this kind of effort to modify the web, modify the structure of the web and its contents mm -hmm. in a way that you will influence the search engine results that will eventually benefit whoever is uh, doing this kind of change. <coughs> I've developed this kind of definition because I found uh, that the way that uh, several social scientists describe who's a propagandist, a propagandist is somebody who's trying to modify our belief system in our brains. Who do we trust and who we do not trust? And therefore influence our actions, like what to buy and who to vote for, in ways beneficial to the propagandist. So practically, this kind of effect, this kind of web spam, as we used to call it, the reason we changed the name from web spam uh, to uh, search engine manipulation effect is because people were confusing the word spam with email spam. Had nothing in common. But the, the reason that I found this very frustrating was because we didn't seem to have a way of defending against that. And what made me very suspicious about how we will solve the problem, lots of technologists got onto this problem and tried to do something about it. Eventually, as you know, in the last year, a lot of people like me are trying to solve these kind of problems is, wait a minute, we have the propaganda for quite a while. We haven't solved that. What makes us believe that we will solve the search engine manipulation effect problem? Um, so I did write about that with um, a colleague back in 2005 with this very provocative title, Web Spam, Propaganda and Trust. And this is the very first time that any computer science uh, article has the term propaganda in. I had troubles publishing it because I would send it to computer science venues and they would say, yeah, very, very interesting, but you know, what does that propaganda have to do with us? And I would send it to social science journals and they would say, that's very interesting, but what is web spam? It seemed that, you know, things were not kind of communicating. What I wrote at that time, this is kind of in my conclusion, the question arises as to what one should do one once one realizes a spamming network, one of these you know, people that they are essentially providing misinformation. This is a question that has not attracted much attention in the past. Yeah, that was 2005. It did not attract much attention until 2016. Uh, the default approach is that the search engine would delete such networks or might downgrade them, having essentially Google decide what should be out of its indexes and what should be in. Both of these approaches, however, require a universal agreement of what constitutes spam. Such an agreement cannot exist. One person's spam may be another person's treasure. Should the search engines determine what is trustworthy and what is not? Willing or not, they are the de facto arbiters of what information users see. I have to tell you that in 2005, telling things like that do not make you a very popular person. People just did not want to believe that Google had anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the first motto for Google? Do no harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew that these are very smart people that trying very hard to make sure that everything just did not appreciate the complexity of the overall issue. So here is how things work in a search engine. You know, it's not like you send a request to a search engine and you mean you get back the result. You think of a query that you have and you send the query to your search engine, but there has been a lot of work in the past that has prepared the search engine to respond to your question. Uh, there are some programs that they continuously look at the web and collect document after document after document and try to create a whole list of them, as many as they can, maybe a trillion or so, and then they create an index, like the indices you have at the back of your book that says you know, where, what page you will find each one of the terms. So when you are asking for a query, it looks to see where the words appear in the index and then find out what are the documents and then give you links to these documents. The important thing that has to happen once just before you get the results is this kind of ranking. Mm -hmm. What's going to end up result number one, number two, number three, etc. And there is a lot of power in deciding that. And people, of course, have realized that. That's why the web spam, this kind of search engine manipulation exists. Because if you could influence what Google will give you as an answer, given the fact that people trust this search engine, why? Because the vast majority of times gives us right good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So when it doesn't, how do you know? There is another 
side of that uh, that plays with uh, you know the way that we search for words, which is called the anchor text. The anchor text was a very good idea, and it does the following thing. The anchor text is what you type whenever you write a web page and you want to link to another page. So you decide to write, uh, let's say, something like uh, uh, the uh, term Wellesley College and create a hyperlink to www.wellesley.edu, your anchor text is Wellesley College. Mm -hmm. In another place, you know, Wellesley College appears in a neighborhood of other uh, words, some of them say uh, best liberal arts colleges. So these terms, best liberal arts colleges, along with Williams and Pomona, are linked, mm -hmm. associated to that. And in another page, somebody else writes the contribution of these nations, women's colleges, blah, blah, blah. And this is the anchor text. That is also an alias. So what a search engine finds by looking at the different anchor texts is ways of understanding what this page is about mm -hmm. by the description of other people giving to their links. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And this can also be spam. One of the very famous spamming techniques um, is called the Google Bot. <coughs> you may have heard of miserable failure being President uh, Bush too. What happened was that a very small number of people, like 29 of them, according to the initial reports, wrote pages in which they created the term miserable failure. It is a combination of words that's not so you know, used uh, widely. And they pointed to George W. Bush's page. And then whenever you were searching for miserable failure, it was coming up quickly. And the more people search for that, the more it came higher up. Of course, people who dislike that, they started creating their own text with miserable failure and putting the name of Jimmy Carter and Michael Moore and <laughs> Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton, who came in positions two, three, and four. And there were a lot of discussion about, you know, George W. Bush's office did not like that. You know, said to Google, do something about that. And Google said, you know, what can we do? Our algorithms are doing that. Which sounded to technical people like me a defensible thing. Our algorithms, I, I didn't do it, they did it. <laughs> um, this kept going on. And when Obama in 2009 he was inaugurated, he became the miserable failure hit number one, in this case, in, in uh, Yahoo. So um, um, yeah, it's not that they're not trying to, uh, to, to uh, uh, solve the problem. But OK, so there, is, there are lots of lies on the internet. Why do we care about that? What can happen to us if we believe in lies? And the first thing, psychological. We feel bad about it. Nobody likes to be lied about, right? All right, we can get away with that. Maybe we will buy some useless health products. All right, maybe I will use this human growth hormone for a few months. Maybe it will not kill me and it will not make me taller. Uh, maybe I will buy a bad car. All right, that hurts a little bit. Maybe I will invest in junk st stocks. Um, even today, there is a lot of information that you could find. You know, If you only buy this stock, which is only like a cent, you will be rich. It doesn't work exactly like that. Well, here it gets a little more trickier. What if you choose the wrong treatment? If you search for treatment for cancer, you will might find ridiculous things. Mm -hmm. You may have already heard some of these things. You know, if you take uh, apricot seeds and you grind them and then you d dissolve them into olive oil and then you leave them outside your, uh, you know, the night for three nights and say some prayers maybe. All right, here it gets a little dangerous not to choose a real treatment. Or maybe we will even choose the wrong candidate. So believing in lies can have a profound effect. That's why we, can, we have to worry about these kind of things. It's not that we can just ignore it. Societies that have believed in lies at some point paid for it. Societies that believe that you know, something impressive would happen or somebody very powerful will come to rescue them have paid in the past. Back in 2000, 
uh, 9, 2010, Senator uh, Ted um, Kennedy died. Mm. The uh, Democrats had 60 seats in the Senate. They could pass anything they wanted without filibuster. Mm. And in our field, the big news was that, you know what? If you follow what people talk about in uh, the social media, you can predict elections. So with my colleagues here, we got very excited. Let's predict elections. That's, that's so cool, right? Predict the future. Who doesn't want that? Uh, predicting the future is a sign of intelligence. So we, we could look intelligent if we could do that. So it seemed like an easy thing to predict. You have a Democrat, Martha Copley, and a Republican, Scott Brown, in Massachusetts for the seat of Ted Kennedy, like you know, the stalwart of the Democratic Party. Why it was so important to have this kind of 60th seat in the Senate? Health care was about to go through the Senate and the House. So who wouldn't want to have that? It was at the same time that Google had introduced the latest search results in the third position of its uh, uh, search results. This, this is results coming from Twitter and Facebook. So. We started collecting the data to see if we could predict the um, uh, elections, not to keep you waiting. No, you cannot <laughs> predict elections with social media. And we were writing about that in 2010. Yet in 2012, newspapers were coming up with uh, you know, little gouges that will tell you who's winning at this time according mm -hmm. to what happens. This is totally B, totally S. <laughs> you know, but people who want to believe something like that, or they have a benefit for believing things like that, would push for this kind of bullshit. Why? Because if you can persuade people that social media can predict elections, then you can influence social media to give people the impression that your candidate will win, mm -hmm. and so the other voters for the other candidates might not even show up mm -hmm. in the elections. A little bit like what happened in 2016. So we wrote about that in this paper, From Obscurity to Prominence. Um, and what we found was that there was a new kid in the block, a new way of actually influencing elections, call it the e Twitter bomb. Hmm. We realized that people were writing computer programs that would post automatically misinformation. And with a little bit of effort, they were able eventually to flood a lot of people's Twitter accounts, uh, later on face, uh, Facebook accounts, with misinformation. Supposedly, in this case, was that Martha Copley, uh, the Democratic candidate, was against Catholics being doctors in emergency room. Hmm. Yeah, and you could find the link and you could see. Initially, there was no sign of who did that. Eventually, as we're ready to publish, we figure out who was doing that. It was. Uh, a group called the American Fund, the Future Fund, which mm. is a group of Iovan Republicans who were promoting this kind of news, who had actually a history of promoting this information. In 2004, they were promoting this information about uh, uh, Kerry, and even before that, about Dukakis. In 2010, they were kind of looking how you could do this kind of misinformation in the new medium. For uh, Kerry, it was on TV, now it was on the internet. So how did they do it? And here is the algorithm of how to fool people. Um, first, you create your misinformation. Create a page like Copley said. It. You create whatever you want there to be um, misinformed. But nobody knows it at that time. Then you create a bunch of anonymous accounts, mm -hmm. in this case on Twitter, but you could do it on Facebook. And then you identify a community that care about the topic. Like you look at who is actually following news about the Massachusetts elections. This is important because then your message can be spread. You target these members of the community by pretending to be you know, part of their community. And once you do that, you let them be excited or angry and start repeating your information. Mm -hmm. So you start your information, you find the excited, angry group, you give them the misinformation, and then you can just delete your account and go into hiding because who cares now? They will do the job for you. Mm -hmm. You know what is upsetting about that, in addition you know, to this technique? It is that this is exactly the technique that those Russian or other Macedonian or whatever you know, idiots did in our elections. Essentially, they did the same thing only on Facebook. They created a bunch of 
websites with misinformation, um, like you know, trumpvision365.com. Then they created fake Facebook accounts, uh, Elena Nikolov and Markovsky and whatever. Then identified groups of political candidates that they were very engaged into that, like you know, Hispanics for Trump or San Diego Bernie Kratz, et cetera, et cetera. And they targeted these members. You know, after they were with them for a while, they started promoting their misinformation and let them, being angry and excited, keep pushing this information then they can go into hide it, they can delete their accounts. That's why it's very difficult to find all of those who started. Because you know, once you let your poison out, you let others who are really upset and passionate about it do the job of promotion for you, and you can go into hiding. Mm. This will happen again. Mark my words. Because always there will be people for some reason they will feel very angry, very excited, very upset. And there will be others who will manipulate them that way. I do not know where, what social medium, or what I've been here, but keep that in mind. So we wrote this article, uh, could we prevent it? I do not know the answer. But most people, when they hear that I'm interested in this misinformation field, they ask me, you know, just solve it, will you? You know, fix your algorithms. I know you have amazing algorithms, just fix it. So I have these, you know, uh, cartoon that one of our students did uh, last year, you know, you want to be told, go to isittrue.com and click on answers. That will do the job for you. Do you think now that you have gone through all of this that uh, using factor recognizing technology will work? If we just have a button? See how complicated it can be? Because who's fact checking? Nevertheless, there is a lot of effort in doing this kind of fact checking right now. I am co-chair of a conference, the major conference in uh, the web, and the topic that I'm uh, you know, looking for search is fact checking techniques. I mean, okay, maybe there is something we can do. And that's where we're going. Maybe there is something we can do. And, and our personal <laughs> answer is we created twittertrails.com. Uh, mm. In which case, we're not going to tell you the answer, but we're going to help you do an investigation. And so in a while, what you will do is essentially you will go into a room and you will start searching for some of the uh, rumors that you initially had to guess in the beginning of this uh, class, right? Uh, you, I ask you to fill up some forms and tell me if they were, you know, guess what they looked like true or not, and you will be able to do that. How does Twitter trail works? It works as follows. You look at a tweet and it looks suspicious. You would like to know whether it was true or, or not. You know, here is, it might be fine one. Dominican newspaper uses picture of Alec Baldwin instead of President Trump. <laughs> really? Is that true? You know, you might want to investigate that. Um, Tillerson used alias email account to discuss climate changes with Exxon. So uh, the uh, uh, Secretary of State was trying to hide discussing with his prior company. Is that really the case? Uh, all the way to Pizzagate. Uh, that supposedly this is uh, a serious issue. So in Twitter trails, we investigate stories. And a story is something that starts with a question like that. So I was looking yesterday to find one of the more recent questions, and I ran into that. So I thought, OK, we'll try that today. Somebody, it is uh, done on the 2nd of October, writes two shooters in Las Vegas, one shooter only. Really, here is the video of the fourth floor shooter. Watch and share. We're talking about the guy on the 1st of October who started shooting on an open um, uh, concert and killed, what, 60 people almost? Don't remember the exact number, right? And on the second day, somebody says, well, actually, there was a second shooter. At that time, we did not know how it was. So th this is the rumor. How can we investigate? Well, I'll do it a little bit with you, and you will get a chance to um, see it for yourself. So it is, um, so here is the claim, and here is what our system looks like. You will be able to go online and do this, go again on Bitly and play the same uh, scenario for yourself. If you go in bit.ly slash tt capitals, as in Twitter trails, 
second shooter you will be able to follow um, what I'm, I'm doing and you, you will have time uh, in a few minutes but I'll show you a little bit how the interface works you start by giving a uh, tweet that seems to be uh, what brought your attention to this issue and this is the tweet that I show you uh, so on Twitter trails you just say okay here is the tweet I want to investigate do the investigation for me and you indicate kind of the keywords and a few minutes later our system comes back and says here is the answer to some of the questions you may want to ask and what are the questions well the first question is who broke the story and when did it happen mm -hmm. in journalistic terms breaking the story means when the story kind of became more known so the system has collected the data and then looks at the moment in which the um, propagation of this kind of rumor became kind of pro more prominent this one seems to be kind of more prominent but what do we see here um, on this x-axis is time so these were tweets uh, created between like 12.30 all the way to 6.30 uh, p.m. Uh, on that day on the 2nd of um, uh, October and the height will tell you how many retweets did each one of these tweets get each one of these bubbles is a tweet so this one got uh, something between 15 and 20 this one got around 35 uh, you can move the cursor and once you move it you will see what is the relevant tweet so if you want to see who, which is the kind of more prominent here is one CIA very sloppy false flag so school play in Vegas video do you know what is the false flag uh, keyword there so um, uh, conspiracy theorists use this term to mean that this is really fake this is you know Washington kind of creating movies that wants to scare us so that we will give up our guns uh, they were using that for lots of other massacres you know so that false flag whenever you see it is some conspiracy theory saying that this really did not happen and got a bit of attention as you can see this is the guy that got the most attention as events were unfolding even Vegas police department first responded uh, state was possibly a second shooter and they were giving links to that so that gives you who kind of broke the story that looks like <coughs> being the the story that broke in the handout I gave you you will see that we are asking you a few questions these questions we formulated so that you will get a sense of how one we recommend things about um, investigating and story in Twitter trails so start looking at when the story broke what's the timeline I'm looking at uh, here how many retweets this got to get an idea of how much visibility this story got so that's one thing the other is when did this all started when it was originated so here's when it broke but when did it start here is the timeline on when the story started and this is the very first tweet that seemed to have kind of broken the story this is the tweet that was done uh, you can see the information about this it was done at 3 54 a.m. 3.54 a.m. on the 2nd of October uh, possibly another shooter on the 4th floor of Vegas that might be, might be a kind of a confused person somebody that worries a lot <laughs> about all of these things who are the main actors who are promoting this kind of investigation this is the next graph that's kind of uh, interest so this is a graph that will tell you the relationship between all of these people how is is it working <coughs> every time somebody is tweeting a little bit of information um, you know is being marked by a node in this graph if somebody else you know tweets some information also gets another node now this might be the primary promoters of misinformation but if there are other people down here who are watching these they recognize they get information by this and let's say this person here retweets both these and that node 
some bond is created between the two. They come a little closer. Let's say another person also retweets both of those. Well, the bond gets a little stronger, and the nodes come a little closer. Even when more people are doing that, these nodes are coming even closer and closer and create clusters. That way we can identify clusters that are related in the information. It's really amazing, this kind of idea, essentially. Every time others identify pairs of people as promoting the same information, these actors become closer. And so we can see some of these actors. You know, here is one, for example. Every time you click, you will see you know, the red elephant was like the most visible node there. And we have automatically colored them with different colors. What do the colors mean? They mean really, here is how we try to figure out to make a sense out of these clusters. What are they? Um, we look at these groups and we look at how they describe themselves into their own profiles. So how people describe themselves into the profiles of Twitter. And we grab all of those, and it seems like the most common words for the Cyan group, the one I was pointing there, was describing with these terms. Make America great again, God, American, Christian, proud, 2A, patriot, and class 65 node. And the other group we have automatically drawn as red. It doesn't have, uh, you know, kind of the most common word seems to be three. It does not have a uh, strong, uh, but has something liberal here, owned, non-culture. It's difficult to say what this is kind of happening. Here is another group that has the 2A. This is and MAGA. So it seems like mostly are of these two different groups. And you could click around and see more about what they say. All right? So um, you, can, you can see what they said and how many uh, tweets they said. And at the end, you will see pictures that these people posted. Um, whenever you put your cursor on top of a picture, you will see essentially what it was written about it. Um, at this point, you will see that some of the pictures are missing. You can see the tweet, the picture is missing. is because Twitter actually, for some reason, figure out that we should close down these accounts. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you were to try to take a look in the initial tweet that I started looking about, you will see that this account has also been um, stopped by Twitter. So Twitter is trying to do something about that and tries to uh, stop this misinformation. So the question is, looking at all of this information, you can probably make a sense, is this really happening? Did this really happen? Looking at what people were saying, looking at the timeline, you know, when it started, when it ended, and get a sense of whether this seems to be a real thing or not. Make sense? So that's kind of the practice you will do when you go down. You will go to break into two rooms, um, two, uh, um, it is uh, E111, so people will take you there in, in two groups. And there you will open your computers and you will uh, follow the instructions that are on the board and you will start doing your own investigation. And when you're done, we will come here. Before you go, however, let me tell you what happened to the other investigation to uh, Pizzagate. I, I'm not going to give you to do the Pizzagate investigation because it's huge and your computer probably does not have enough memory to handle it. So in the Pizzagate investigation, this is when the story broke. Um, and the most prominent member is this. It is a Turkish journalist complaining that while people in America abuse children, other people in the world complain about Turks abusing Syrian uh, orphans. There was a scandal at that time in Turkey, and he felt really obliged to do that. Mm -hmm. And this had kind of major revival in the misinformation. This will tell you also how the information spread, mm -hmm. will tell you um, how it got a lot of attention. Um, uh, this is where the, uh, our system picked up the attention. Who wrote first about it? It was an account that now actually is closed. By the way, I showed you how the clusters are created, right? Mm -hmm. Look how this cluster of main actors 
can't see very well here. But oh. <laughs> this is what an echo chamber looks like. There is no doubt it has almost 4,500 followers. Trump and MAGA and Truth and Love and Conservative is what characterizes them. The red is also father and Trump and deplorable, etc., etc. <laughs> so these people go around, just promote their own belief. Nobody disagrees with them. One of the highest visibility node is this woman here, Brittany Pettibone, a young woman who's writing teenage stories for, um, you know, kind of mysteries and such, who's mm -hmm. really upset with what people do to young kids. Maybe that's why she's a twin. And she's at the center of that later on. You know, she feels really she has a cause and she's fighting for that. Mm -hmm. And then you can follow up seeing a lot of despicable pictures uh, throughout um, this. Uh, that, um, as you can see, Twitter is trying to delete a lot of those. All right? So are you excited now to go and do your search? Yes. All right. Yes. Let's do it.